Oh wait, you gotta do the. We're doing it with You AQ? gotta do the YouTube. Shit. We need. The, we can't start a show without the intro. Go warm up the lungs here, AQ. We're talking hockey, Sidney Crosby. We're talking hockey. Back with AQ Shipley. Woo! Welcome to that's hockey talk. <laughs> and that's right, we are back with Super Bowl champion AQ Shipley. Uh, a baby, our pal, our northern friend. Gumpy, pal the pal, a lot of the lads is with us as well. AQ, congrats on the new gig. You're a retired player, but now you have moved on to the coaching ranks. You won a Super Bowl as a coach, and now you're back. You're back as a coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. How's it feel, buddy? How's it feel? Oh, man, it feels good. It feels good to get back into it. It feels good to feel good to get away and just kind of enjoy the last month as a, uh, as a champ. Yeah, and, I mean, you just took a two-week hiatus from the show, just gallivanted all around the country. Yeah, just moving, getting getting, getting the move squared away back here in Arizona, and uh, just long enough to live here to make a trip back east. So <laughs> looking, looking forward to this. Yeah, because I think last time we talked to you, your future was still quite uncertain. But at least now you have a direction, you have a path. You're back with the champs, and you're looking to run it back. Yeah, no doubt. I'm, I, I mean, this is kind of what I've wanted all along, and – um bruce kind of laid the groundwork as soon as the whole thing happened so it was awesome super grateful to them for giving me an opportunity right out right out of my playing days and um looking forward to learn from that group obviously super bowl champion group a lot of rings amongst that coaching group so i'm just going to dive in and you know do as much as i can as an entry-level guy and learn as much as i can along the way and hopefully be able to climb the ladder you fill that hand with rings out there, AQ. Let's go. What an incredible hockey guy cliche answer. Just cliche after cliche. Not really saying anything, but saying oh so much. At the same hey, time. I have learned over the years that when you give an interview and you don't want to piss anybody off, you just stay right down the middle. <laughs> Uh, talking about throw their hat in the coaching and let's get right into it with what's going on in the NHL because we see Daryl Sutter come in was kind of the surprise hire take it over for Jeff Ward in Calgary and I think everyone thought oh boy Sutter old school coach how's this going to work out he jumps right in they win three games this guy it looks like he can do no wrong right now he's pushing all the right buttons it looks like a completely different team everything you read coming out of Calgary the sun is shining again the team's winning goals are getting scored Markstrom's playing great what it's like the universe flipped upside down and everything is gold again. You look at the Islanders, they just lost uh, after winning nine straight games. The Hurricanes had an eight-game streak, ended the Penguins last night, uh, six games. All these winning streaks come to an end. Calgary gets their three-game streak going. And on the flip side of things in the coaching world, the Buffalo Sabres on a 12-game losing streak. Un believable with the amount of talent that's on the roster ralph cougar finally gets the axe uh how could we not have seen this coming how like you look at ralph cougar's career okay he was a he was a one-year head coach for the edmonton oilers he got that gig after being the swiss men's team national team head coach years ago uh, he's a big international hockey guy, comes in, gets a gig with the Oilers, flames out after a year, kind of disappears from the scene for a while. Why is that, you say? Gumpy, you may know this. Oh, he becomes a uh, front office guy for Southampton. Is that correct? The EPL? The Southampton Saints? Good yeah. squad. Great squad. He jumps over to the soccer world. This is, this is Ted Lasso. Everyone loved Ted Lasso. It was a great show, right? You know why that worked? Because it was fiction. Because it wasn't real life. You can't just jump into the soccer world for six years, then jump back into the NHL and be a head coach for the Buffalo Sabres and expect it to work. There's obviously a lack of direction. Kevin Adams, first-year GM, they bring over Ralph Kruger, who was just managing soccer for six years, comes back, and no wonder they fell flat on their face. I can't believe we didn't see this sooner, and we weren't. I know there were some jokes made when Kruger jumped back into the league, but how did we not say, like, how did we not just lambaste them? How did we not just put the screws to them? Be like, what are they doing in Buffalo? I think you just had to look at it like uh, he, exactly what you said. He took over a team with a ton of talent. There's no way you can screw this thing up. No way. No way. You got Jack Eichel. You bring in Eric Stahl. You sign Taylor Hall to the one-year deal. Oh, my God. Everything's great. You sign Jeff Skinner to the big deal. Things are looking good. Buffalo. 
Hey, just drawing things up in the snow out there. Just put them out there on the ice. Let's go. The Bills God. are good again. God, what what do we, we got Josh Allen. What, everything's great in Buffalo. Let's bring in this soccer guy. He'll be our head coach. Everything will be perfect. Well, unfortunately, with all the signings and such, it just pulled the wool over everybody's eyes. No one paid attention to the coach. And, and let's be honest. The coach is far from the only problem. But somebody has to pay the price, right? And they always say, we always say it, you can't fire the players. It's very hard to trade with what's going on with the COVID restrictions and everything right now. And when you got a GM who's is basically inexperienced as Kevin Adams is, his first real first real gig in the front office as a running the show as a GM, he's got no one to lean on. We talked to Aaron Ward last week about potentially bringing in someone like Jimmy Rutherford, who the Penguins let go. Uh was a GM in Carolina when Adams played there. You know, that's a familiar voice. These guys been through the battles. He could come in there and, and lend a helping hand and be a voice of reason as like a as a special assistant to the GM or a president of hockey ops, something like that. Uh, Buffalo, it just seems like they're just treading water and willing to just wait out this dumpster fire until the end of the season. They they ax the coach. Now what's next? You're you're not gonna fire Adams because he's he just got there. So do you start looking to move some of these guys out the door? Is it time to ship some of the players out and try and get some new blood in there? It seems like they got a lot of similar players, a lot of skill players. Is it time to try and get a different type of player in the Sabres locker room? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. I mean, they're, they're, they need to change a lot. And where do you start? I don't know. You don't know. I don't think any of us know, right? But whatever it was, wasn't working. It, now, could now you fire a coach? And could you get the same result that um, Sutter's kind of given his team? It's like, I don't know. Is somebody going to – did you just need one little thing, right, just to kind of jumpstart them? I doubt it. But, you know, you had to start somewhere. And – It'd be different if they just had like a bunch of old heads that they made these moves. But Taylor Hall's a young star, like he, or, or, or so we thought, right? And so uh, Jack MVP, Eichel, what, like we all said, ago. was a generational talent. They got players, so it, it something's got to get this thing jump started. I don't know where to start. I, apparently, they don't know either. But the head coach was the first one to get it. I think the easy thing is you start you, you know you're bottom feeding right now you know you're a seller the deadline's coming up you get Eric Stahl off the door and you send him somewhere where he can go chase another ring and try and get some uh, more picks in return I know like you're sick of being in the rebuilding mode but you got to let these guys go these older guys and bring in some 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 more youth. But then you also need to find the right mix of veterans because you thought you were getting that with Eric Stahl, but obviously it hasn't worked out. you got to find the right mix of veterans to lead them and to change that culture because it's just going to be that continuous. You see it in the NFL too, AQ. You've experienced it, that continuous cycle of losing and how that just breeds more losing atmosphere and environment around the team. It's like a bad cloud hanging around the team. you got to switch it up somehow. Hey, you fire the coach now. You're not going to do it with the GM. He's new. you you got to look at the players next. So I think Stahl's going to be on his way out the door. Taylor Hall signed the one-year deal, probably expecting a situation similar to this, like, hey, I can I can make a move at the deadline, bounce back in free agency this next offseason. So you look at those two guys, those are the easy ones to make. Then we've talked at length in the past about do you get rid of Jack Eichel and what do you do there? Luckily for them, uh, unluckily for him, he has the injury. He's sidelined for a while. Uh, that's something you probably – we've talked about that company. You probably revisit that in the offseason, right? That's a big-time decision to make. The other ones are easy. Uh, Hall and Stahl, send them out, no problem. Eichel, you want to sit down in the offseason. You want to figure out who your coach is going to be, and then you make that kind of decision. You can't just keep rebooting. That's the issue, right? No. Like, you, that's you, literally what they just did, like – this season was supposed to be, okay, here we go. Now we got guys, let's play. So you can't – I don't know what you do. You're stuck. You need you need veteran leadership in the organizational level. Like like we keep going. Kevin Adams is the first year GM here. You got to bring in uh, somebody if you if you want to coach. This is a situation where you could look at like a Bruce Boudreaux, someone who's been around with a ton of different teams and a ton of different players and experience what's going on there. Now he's never rebuilt a team per se from the ground up, but he's he's been around enough to know what it takes. Then you look at you 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 bring in another voice, maybe a president of hockey ops, someone like an established. Uh, former GM or a former team president somewhere to kind of lend an ear to Kevin Adams, someone else to bounce off of and, and see what's going on because the Pagulas, it's, it's clear they have money. They're willing to throw money at problems. 
but they've got a lot of other situations going on. They're, you know, they're, they're working with the Bills. They got, they got a big-time situation with the football team going on. So I don't think all their attention is diverted to the Sabres. I think the Sabres could use uh, a jolt of strong leadership at the organizational level to kind of get them back on track. And then you make a couple trades. You know, you get a couple draft picks. You can kind of you can swing this thing around fairly quickly if you're if you're willing to roll with the core. You have some good players, Rasmus Ristolainen, Rasmus Dahlin on defense. Like there's some good guys there, there's some pieces. You just I don't think it's all doom and gloom. It's magnified obviously by a 12 game losing streak, which is just as ugly as it can get. But I I, I think it's salvageable. I don't think you need to completely burn it down and rebuild again. Let's talk about another team that's actually been playing above expectations this season but now it looks like they may run into a bit of trouble we mentioned them earlier the new york islanders had their nine game win streaks now now they're without captain anders lee uh going down with an acl injury he's gonna have surgery out for the season uh probably not a household name across the league but a guy steady dependable gonna give you 20 to 30 goals gonna battle his ass off in front of the net big body the Isles are gonna miss him like they don't have a ton of offense they get it done with depth and with different guys throughout the lineup he's one of the he's one of the key pieces and especially where you're not super deep at the center ice position already you take him out of there that's that's problematic like how how do they look to overcome this I don't I don't think they'll be a team that's gonna go out and, and try and make a major swing at the deadline to try and fill that they might try and get uh, uh, another center in there to help them out but I don't see them be a major player for a big name that, that's not their mo no i agree i mean and that's a team obviously as penguin fans you're, you're very familiar with you've watched anders lee kind of have that net front hornquist type presence that's going to just piss people off in front of the net he's going to get you those ugly goals the tip goals he's got the long reach so he's always getting those little juicy rebounds and putting it in and you're going to miss that a ton from him the islanders are going to miss that a ton they're not even sure how much they're going to miss, but they're they're going to they're going to realize that very shortly, obviously. And like you said, you won't be able to replace that because there's very few guys that are that have that grimy nature that want to just take all the shots in the back and play in front of the net. But they will get to, they'll, they'll get a centerman. Who who will they get? I don't know. Obviously, they're a contender, so they're going to make the right move. But um, yeah, that's a that's a big loss for them. And you know, obviously, with an ACL injury, depending on how the NHL comes back, you know, next season, you know, obviously they've had some weird seasons these last two years, but let's say they have a normal start time. He's going to miss half of next season. I mean, that's a, that's a huge loss moving forward for the next year and a half. It's problematic for sure. And you look at where they're sitting at 42 points, they're tied for the lead in the, in the East. And it's just, it's a devastating blow because if they don't hang on, uh, Pittsburgh's right behind them with 37 Boston's at 34. Boston was running away Boston's with it for a while. 34. Yeah. A little bit of a slide for the Bruins four, four and two in their last 10. I don't think it's anything to worry. We worried about I think it's the natural ebbs and flows of the season. Like they started out super hot. They're going to cool off a little bit. They got some injuries to work through guys, a little banged up. They'll come back strong. Whatever. The Isles, they kind Kind of we're reaching their peak right now it seems like do they take a huge step back without Anders Lee I don't know if it's huge but it's going to be it's going to be tough to kind of fill that void that he left so they might drop a few you might see them go on a little bit of a slide I mean nine and one that we just talked about nine and one their last ten like even with him that's hard to keep that pace and replicate that and what are we now we're they're 30 games into the season, so you're past the halfway point. Uh, this is this is kind of a critical time here right now to figure out what you have in terms of guys off the taxi squad or call-ups from from the the depths of the organization to see if anyone could fill that hole he leaves at center ice. Uh, it's 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 frustrating because if you're an Isles fan, you've seen so many wasted opportunities and you and you watch Tavares leave and you watch Barzell blossom into an offensive guy and he kind of struggles a little bit his numbers aren't through the roof anymore and this season that seems to be changing he seems to be figuring it out the whole Lou Limarillo uh, shadow over the organization kind of provides stability but also you know they're going to play a certain way and they're going to act a certain way you're flying high you got Barry Trotz in there you're getting good elite goaltending basically from Semyon Varlamov and now you get a huge blow to one of your key players so uh, I, I think they'll figure it out. I think they'll be able to tread water, but it's definitely going to impact them. Uh, I think they'll be they'll take a slide. I don't think they're going to be sitting still at first in the division for the next couple weeks. Meanwhile, the Capitals, who are first in the division, can anyone stop Ovechkin? He gets what is it? Is only his twelfth goal of the season, but he passes Phil Esposito all time, sixth all time in the NHL goal scoring list with seven eighteen. 
We talked, uh, I think, last year about him pot potentially catching Gretzky, and we kind of joked about it and thought, Meh, maybe. I think he's going to do it. I think he's going to do it. He's, what, 170-some goals now from it now? He's so consistent, too. Like, he never really goes in, like, long goal droughts. And the Capitals are consistent, too, like, always. Yeah, always a stud. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, you, you every time you turn it on, it's like you just see uh, that – wicked wrist or wicked one time or wicked slap shot from somewhere and he's getting one a game i mean it seems like every time you turn it on it's like oh there's another one i mean it's just it is what it is you know he's gonna be setting up shop over there in the corner and waiting for his little one timer on the power play he's gonna get one he's gonna take five of them a game he's gonna get one out of five i mean it's incredible to watch and um yeah i do think he's got a great shot at catching him i think this shortened year might have hurt just a little bit you know it's yeah. gonna it's i think yeah. it's gonna make it iffy it's but, funny, though, to watch yeah. how he's evolved, too, because when he came into the league and even his first couple of years in the league, you knew exactly what he's going to do. And he still does some of those things to this day very well. But he got figured out there for a little bit in the sense of people knew he was going to tee up at the point on the power play for the one-timer. And he's still doing that, and he still does it well. But you know it's coming. Uh, teams have keyed onto that a little bit. But the old move of just blow by a defenseman down the boards and then cut to the middle of the ice right around the faceoff dot and fire that wrist shot. Uh, that was the one teams really keyed on, and they were kind of able to help eliminate that with the bracket move, having a guy back check and, and kind of play two on him and kind of force him uh, to keep going wide or whatnot. But, man, it's it's crazy how consistently good his shot is. It's, the, it's arguably the best shot I've ever seen as an NHL fan for 30-some years. Like, I can't think of anyone who even compares to having that consistency, that velocity, and that accuracy with a wrist shot and or a slap shot because the guy brings it every single time. It's ridiculous. And it's it's still uh, – how old is he now? Almost 35, might be 35. Uh, it's awe-inspiring to watch even in his uh, – I, I, I refuse to call it his twilight years because he's still putting up huge numbers. So even in these later years in his career, like he's still just – just as good as he ever, ever was in terms of putting the puck in the net. Uh, and it's going to be very, very interesting to see if he can get close to Gretzky's record because as long as he stays healthy and the Caps keep putting a competitive team around him, he's going to do it. I'm very interested also to see what his contract negotiations look like because I think he's done. I think his current deal is up after uh, – it might be next season or maybe this season. I'll have to look that up and double check. But he's – he's going to break the bank again. Remember, he signed that 13-year, $100 million deal, and at the time, it was one of the biggest deals in the NHL history. I can only imagine what the next one's going to look like. Is he going to do a little less to be team-friendly for the Caps to help them out, or is he going to break the bank again? Because the way he takes care of his body... He's going to go past guy might 40, play to, right? Yeah, a guy, a guy could play well into his 40s. Yeah. Look at how long Yager did it till. You know what I mean? Yager's a different breed. He's such a different specimen. <laughs> and he changed his game, and he evolved into into such a different player than what he used to be. But, man, it's like that's a that's a good guy to look up to right. and kind of mold it after and say, hey, okay, if I got his game a bit. He has, for sure. He used to he used to run around and hit everybody and just run through guys. And it's, he's still physical. I'm yeah. not saying he's not. But it, it's definitely calmed down in a sense. Like, he knows he doesn't have to go balls to the wall every night. He's got Tommy Wilson to do that now. He's got Tom Wilson to ram his shoulder into somebody's head for him. Hey, kids, he buddy. What a slap dick. <laughs> yeah, how about him hitting Carlo the other night right in the head and just – yeah, it just it's like I got. Come on, dude. Come on. I mean, I'm it's over. like the seventh I'm time now. I'm over. Are you over him? Yeah, I'm completely over him. <laughs> Wish he was on the Penguins. Let's talk about the Penguins. You're back. It's two two weeks now. Two week hiatus. Penguins are playing a little bit better. How do you feel about the team? Did you get a chance to watch them last night? Even though they lose to Dan Vladar, Bruins fucking four nice. stringer yeah. basically in his first game, his first full game in the league. He played one period last year in the playoffs. Now he gets his first full game. Only lets in one. He looked unbelievable. Looked unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I I don't miss Penguin games. I mean, I I watch as much hockey as I can, but I certainly don't miss Penguin games. I watch them every night. My wife hates me. My daughter hates me. She wants to watch Bubble Guppies, but I'm watching Chris Letanger. I'm watching Crosby. I'm watching everything. Hey, Skyler, get one hour to watch the Penguins, and then we go back to Bubble Guppies. You got it? And that's what we <laughs> wait, do. Wait, what so, is Bubble Guppies? Um, oh, yeah, I've been watching them. They look, they look like Guppy? a whole different team from the last time I've been on. They look incredible. They they, they went on a nice little six game run. Hold on, hold on. You just, what is Bubble Guppy? It's trust me. This whole kids show thing. 
It's terrible, but man, they love it. You they watch eat Peppa it up, Pig, huh? you watch Bubble Guppies, you watch a bunch of nonsense, and they just have a few songs, a couple little jingles, and they all you love it. Well. That's why, that's why I, I need my two hour break where I watch my penguin hockey. <laughs> Papa needs his medicine. Just like, like an that's old it. Man that's it. I can I can lose Jesus. it a little bit. I can yell at people, <laughs> but it's um yeah. That guy looked incredible last night. Might might be the save of the year, right? First game, first game might be save of the year. Might be. There was there was a couple good ones, uh, and uh, there were a couple good paddle saves. I always love a good desperation paddle save. I hated that one obviously because because it was against the Pens. But it, considering the circumstances that that was his first game. I think you got to put it up there, and that's got to be the front runner for me for now. That game had a playoff feel to it last night too. It did. At the end of the game, it was buzzing. It was really buzzing. It did. It had, had good, they were skating, had good speed. Yeah. Tanev had the nice hit, which he got a little, he got a little animosity somewhere in the middle of the game, and then people had to bounce back. Bad call, I thought by the refs. Bad call. I thought so too, um, and I didn't. I didn't really want to get into it, but let's get into it because look. I, I hate the accusations of being a homer, and I understand how the rule is written with boarding and it making basically the referee's discretion that if the player gets hurt like that, it's basically an automatic suspension and major, or I shouldn't say suspension, automatic misconduct and a major. But, I mean, circumstances, come on. We know what boarding is. When you watch a game, you know what boarding is. You know you're hitting a guy. I know the rule says a player pushed or checked violently into the boards. That hit was eight, maybe ten feet from the boards, and Tenorti took an awkward tumble. It's unfortunate. We said it. We hope he's all right. But the only thing that I will say is tan there was another angle that they showed that wasn't on the TV broadcast that was floating around the Internet. It was from the wide – angle from across the ice and you see Tanev come from the far boards and he beelines it and it's it's for sure a charge could have called a two minute charging would have had no issues with that could have called a two minute boarding would have had no issues with that even if you wanted to give it five minute major wouldn't have liked it but would have said okay I could see how it fits fits the wording of the boarding rule the way it's labeled in the rule book the misconduct I thought was unnecessary it was a clean hit it was, head wasn't the principal point of contact. It was to the chest. Tenorti had an awkward fall, and his head hit the boards, unfortunately. And it did look like he lost consciousness in there. It looked bad. But even the homerest of Homer play-by-play -play announcers, Jack Edwards of the Boston Bruins, this guy, you can look him up. You can Google him. He said some despicable things. He even said, boy, I don't know. I don't think that was worthy of that. So I, he, he called it clean. So that's my two but I, I, hate, I, hate I don't know what you thought, Tumpy, but I thought it was clean too. I mean, it was. He just. I mean, that's Tanev's game, right? I mean, he's a he's a, he's a hard worker. He's going to finish checks. He's going to he's going to do the grimy stuff. And um, but he plays clean. He does. He's. Not, I don't think he's a cheap shot guy. I don't think he's sitting there putting sticks between people's legs. I don't think that was a shot. If you if you didn't get that, yeah, but, yeah. yeah it, um, you know. But at the end of the day, I think. Uh, I think he plays the game way. the right way. So to sit there and, and make him out to be a villain in that instance, I think is wrong. I think them, again, I agree with you. You want to call him penalty for whatever it is because the guy got hurt. I, I agree. And we all hope that it, it isn't serious, right? But I, I, I don't I don't see a game misconduct. And now if it goes to the league and they give him another game or two, I, I'll be, I would be very, very upset. I thought, I thought the good the good thing about them handling it the way they did on the ice, the only positive to take from that is that uh, I, I think that wipes out the idea of any additional or supplemental discipline, as I like to call it. Um, the other thing with that is I don't like griping about calls like that because there are bad calls in every game. We know NHL officiating is not the model. It's not the pristine. It's not the standard. Uh, if you're a good enough team, you overcome that situation. Now, granted, you were already missing Evgeny Malkin because he left the game with an injury. Now you lose Tanev. You're only playing with 10 forwards. But I've, just, I've always had that mindset, like, don't bitch about the calls. If you're a good enough team, you'll overcome. Like, that happened early enough in the game where there was enough time to overcome. And they responded well. They it was did. an unbelievable five-minute kill. If it's something that if it's something egregious that happens in overtime or the last couple minutes or seconds of the third period, okay. But my personal philosophy, I just don't like bitching about it because you're not going to change anything with with the with the refs. We just we know what it is. We have to accept that it's a bad standard of officiating, and we have to you have to play within those bad standards. A little consistency would be nice because Zach Aston Reese, what well, was it three games ago? 
uh, against Buffalo had a very similar, but much closer to the boards, much more uh, deliberate, and it was a bad hit, and it was impactful, and he got nothing for it. So, well, like you can you can you can like Sidney Crosby, you can hate him. I think that's the only two type of people in this world. There's no there's no down the middle with him, right? And then I, I loved his post game comments. He was he was like, "Listen, okay, cool. You want to call it? We all wish him." That wasn't what it was, but here's the deal as a player. We just want consistency. We want black and white. We don't want gray. So there needs to be some type of clear explanation as to what is clean and what is not clean. And I think that's all as a player in any sport in our world, it's the same thing, right? You know, all the targeting calls in football, it's like, well, you know, I played the game for 22 years like this. And now all of a sudden you make this thing or you're going to take 50 grand out of my pocket. And so, at the end of the day, I just want to know what's clear and what's not, right? I, I don't want this ref calling one thing and that ref calling another. That's what I mean. So it was a it was a big deal on Twitter. The video started circling around, and I said I didn't think it was worth five in a major. Get called a homer. You get you get called. Uh, you don't know the rules. Google boarding, and you look at the rule. Like I understand the letter of the law with how the rule is written. It's written to be a catch-all. It's written to be – they changed the rule in 2011. It's written to be if a player falls into the boards after a hit, it's up to the ref's discretion about how they can how they can make the call. I just – I think it needs to be enforced all the time like that. Or none of the time. Or none of the time. And it's, it's clearly not been that way because we've seen similar hits all year long and they have not been a five in a game. You know, a five's one thing, a game misconduct in what was it? It was, was yeah. the second period, I think. Even that's if a, you give that's them a big the five, you just, the game, there's no need for the game misconduct. You can't do it. Not there. Not can't do that, it, Bob. Gumpy, Gumpy spoke. You can't do can't it. Can't have it. Not a homer. Not a homer. Stars fan. I mean, the, I mean, you had anybody who's anybody, though, of hockey opinion chiming out saying, like, I know rear. R.A., the Spit and Chicklets guys, Whitney, they, they said they, they thought it was clean to the grid. Butcher Gross tweeted out that it was a clean hit. It didn't deserve five in a game. So it's like, I know the way the rule's written, but I also know what I see with my eyes. And there has to be some type of – they're all judgment calls, right? They can they can try and say they're not, but pretty much every call a refer, an NHL referee makes in a hockey game is a judgment call to some degree. So I think there needs to be some – standard there and some level of okay yeah he hit him he did fall into the boards but i don't think that's five in a game i think it's just a two minute that's uh, uh, sorry that grinded my gears i didn't want to get into it but here we are let it eat here we are let it out let it like out. that's the thing though now i gotta keep that energy when i next time i see somebody else get boarded like that he what he did charge though he took like he took like oh, he nine was, strides if you watch the other angle he, he took like nine strides it was, it was unbelievable it looked yeah. like tom wilson going and hitting that fucking fake dummy on the ice in the practice fucking thing <laughs> in the off season. uh let's try uh, let's get to a more positive note uh the toronto maple leafs kyle dubas their gm much maligned for his youth and his analytical takes is basically come out and said he's all in on what the team's doing this year and he's right to be because they are lighting it up this year they got good goaltending they got strong d he wants to push this team over the top he wants to make a deadline move he said he's all in to make a deadline move they're talking about getting maybe a winger uh and he said he's fine with a rental and a lot of times you hear GMs like they won't be that candid or like they'll try and be secret about it. And like, yeah, we're looking to improve the hockey team. But Dubas basically said, like, it doesn't have to be a hockey trade for us. Like, I think he realizes, hey, we got a window here. All the eyes in Canada are on the Leafs because of the aligned division with the North. And, and everybody's been talking about it. You know, this is basically Canada's crowning jewel here, this North division. And now you've got a season where the Leafs are dominant, looking to make a run. And the curse, they got Joe Thornton back, you know, Jumbo, trying to do it for Jumbo. Now do you go out and you get somebody else to bring alongside? Uh, or do you look at, like, Eckholm in Nashville? He seems to be the guy that everybody's after. He seems to be the trade deadline darling. So I don't know I don't know who they're going to get. We'll look more into that in the future now that we know that they're definitely looking to add someone and they're okay with it being a rental. We'll, we'll do our research there and we'll come back with that. But I love the, I love the attitude. I love the confidence, and I love them sending the message through the media to the guys in the locker room, like, hey, you guys have played really well this year. We talk about this all the time, AQ. You, you guys have played really well this year, and we're going to do what it takes to make sure that that doesn't go unnoticed and we get you some help. You have that's, to. That, that's literally half the battle. I mean, that's 
that's why you're seeing all the the Russell Wilson and the Deshaun Watson trying to take control of their destiny now because they're like, listen, like we're giving you everything we got. I got a window. I literally have a window that's this big to win. And if you're not going to give me the people that I need and you're going to trade away the Legion of Boom if you're Russell Wilson and get rid of all those guys and get rid of all these D-linemen when we had the best defense in the league, if you're going to, you know, trade trade away DeAndre Hopkins if you're Deshaun Watson and get rid of a bunch of other guys, it's like, I want out. Like, if you're not going to put the team around me, and it's, it's, it goes like that It goes like that for any sport, right? Like, you, you want to – uh, be noticed for what you're putting out there effort wise and ability wise. And then you also want to have guys around you that can also help you be- help the team better and help make you better. So I mean, I think it's an unbelievable move on their part. I think it's been so long since Toronto has had a real chance to win it too. I mean, they've put good teams together kind of on the brink a little bit, but like to have a team this year, that's really right there. You got to strike while the iron's hot. Cause who knows when you'll get back to this spot. I saw this floating out there, and I want to get your take on it. Uh, Austin Matthews, lighting it up, right? Best season of his career, arguably. Just goals night after night, putting the team on his back. There's talk now in the Toronto media, do they sit him a couple games? Because of where they're at in the division. Let's take a look. Uh, They are currently four points ahead of Winnipeg. They got 40 points with uh Winnipeg has two games in hand so it's close but like they they feel comfortably about a playoff spot there's talk about sitting him now because they're going on something like 25 games or 28 games within like 50 days how how do you guys feel about that I don't think I'd do it maybe maybe one or two games just to give him a maintenance day and take care of himself but like he's still young he's he takes care of himself he's not he's not a slouch like he doesn't have the Phil Kessel body either. Like you see that through his legs. He's got he's got some quads. He's a big boy. Like I don't I don't know if it needs to be like NBA load management. I'd maybe give him one or two nights off if you if you feel like he needs it. If you see him like looks like he's slowing down or something. But it is a, it is a, it is a talking point because he's the guy. Like if they lose him, I don't think you're putting them in the cup contender conversation anymore. I don't think you can simulate uh, games. Period. Right. So. In a shortened season period, I think you need the games regardless of what sport, right? I think in hockey, even more so because guys that miss time, it takes them forever to kind of get back in the swing of things, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan. If you want to manage his load a little bit, give him, give him off days in practice. Give him complete days off on, on his rest days, right? And um, things like that. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that at all because I think you get out of um, the swing of things. You get out of the momentum that you got going. You get out of the feel of the game and what you have right now. And he's playing at an unbelievable tear right now. I mean, he looks like he's MVP, unstoppable like, on the ice. Give him the heart. Yeah, I mean, he's he's having an unbelievable year and scoring goals from any which way he wants and just doing whatever he wants. And the minute you kind of get out of that feel – you don't want you don't want to take him out of that field. He's in a special place right now. You want to just keep riding that thing. Yeah, unless he's banged up or he yeah, he says, you know, you know, give me a night. I need a night. Let it ride, and then you get to the end of the season when you've clinched. You know what I mean? Then you give him a night off. And he's never going to do that. Up. He's no. never going to go to the team and say, hey, give me no. a night. But unless if, he's banged up, there's no reason. But to. you look, they have a couple games against Vancouver left. I think a couple games against Ottawa, a handful of games against Ottawa. Like you said, once they clinch, you look towards the end of the season. Okay, maybe a night, just one or two. If you got a back to back or something yeah. like that, special circumstances cases. But uh, for the most part, I'm with you guys. Like, let them ride. This is the way the league's been forever. I don't see a reason to change it now. I understand it's a condensed schedule because of COVID, but I think you got to roll with what got you there. And I think the minute you take your foot off the gas, you start to get that mentality. Of, oh, well, it's a slippery slope, right? It's like, oh, we start with Matthews. And, well, maybe we give Marner a night off. And you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't see a need for it unless he, unless something happens where he tweaks an ankle or a knee or a wrist or something like that. And lastly, boys, before we get out of here, uh, we've kind of been neglecting them a little bit, and I feel like it's time to give them some love. Uh, the Minnesota Wild. We talk all the time about how they've been just mirrored in mediocrity. When it, they've had good players, they've had great players, but they've never had elite talents. They've never had the stars in Minnesota. Huh, you like that? Minnesota North Stars a little. Yeah, that was a good pun. Got it. Uh, they got. They got stars now. They got Kaprizov. This kid 
is a lock for the Calder Trophy. He flies around the ice every single night. Had his first hat trick in a period the other night. He's entertaining as hell to watch. He's skating on his edges like Crosby. He's finishing like McDavid and Ovechkin. 25 points in, what, 20, 27 games. He, he's doing this against grown men. He's 23 years old. First first year of the league, he comes over from Europe. It's like he had been playing with men in Europe, but it's always, hey, it's the NHL. This is different over here. It's North America. You're getting knocked around a little bit. The physical stuff doesn't really seem to bother him. He's got the puck on a string every single night, just dangling. Looks unbelievable. I don't know how much you've got to see him make you, but like it's it's become appointment viewing for me that like anytime the Wild are playing, eh, I'm like I got to see what this kid's doing. Yeah, he's a supreme talent. There's no question. Again, I haven't uh, I haven't watched much Minnesota Wild before this year, but I've watched Same. more Minnesota Wild in the last month than I think I've watched, you know, maybe ever. And, uh, yeah, the kid's special. I mean, he's, he, he, you're, every, the way you described him is a hundred percent spot on. I mean, he flies around. He's, he's not afraid to go into the dirty zones. I mean, he, he plays the whole 200 foot game. He's kind of doing everything right. And, um, it's, it's, it's fun to watch and it's fun to see them kind of have a little talented player and kind of to be able to build around now for the future. It's funny what one player especially a youthful player like that can do for that franchise. Cause we talked about it at length, like mediocrity, just they, they got some guys, but there's no one there to get them over the hump. He might be that guy because it feels like everyone on the team gets a, a boost of energy. Uh, call it the youthful enthusiasm, whatever you will. They just seem to be playing that much better. And now I mentioned stars because he's not the only one. They've gotten quite a lift in goal from we got it right. Capo Kakinen. There's so many, there's Kasperi Cap Kapanen. There's Capo Kako in New York, and now there's Capo Kakinen, the 24-year-old in Minnesota. This guy was a fourth-rounder uh, on the year, 12-4. and four. And I think he's on a 9-0 run right now with two shutouts. Like, he is unbelievable in that just playing elite level, 927 save percentage. Can't say enough good things about the kid. Uh, it's, it's nice to see the Minnesota Wild fans who have just been like – in purgatory for years in the NHL, finally get like some guys that they can be like, okay, yeah, we got, we finally got our guys. We got some fucking elite studs that are going to win us games. And can he keep it up? I don't know. We see, we see flash in the pans every season, especially in goal. We see guys who go on tremendous runs and then disappear, never to be heard from again. But I think, I think he might be, I think he might be legit. The Finns, man, they know how to they know how to pump out goalies. Duke Rass been doing it for years. Yeah, I mean, Minnesota. How long's it been since they've had like what was the last great goalie they had? Uh, they, I mean, they had Dubnik, and he was pretty good there for a little bit. Kind of like, kind of turned his long, career in a little bit. Yeah, Dubnik stinks. Dubnik stinks. He's he's a six foot seven. <laughs> who else did they when they made that Stanley Cup run? Who did they have? I can't even remember. Oh boy, you're, it's dating me now. So like looking back, like this is just the the past couple they've ran through. You had it. I think you had Alex Stalock. You had uh, the other Nicholas Backstrom. He was good for a while. Darcy Kemper, Josh Harding, Cam Talbot, Manny Fernandez. Oh, there he is, Manny Fernandez. Dwayne Rollison. Oh, Rolly the goalie. They tried the Hamburg Hamburglar Andrew Hammond. They had Dobby Anton Hudo. Oh, Gumpy, your stars. What do you got? The bells of the ball the other night with their jerseys. I mean, the just... all whites with just a little green trim. You come out, you light up the lightning early. <laughs> maybe <laughs> or... just maybe just save those jerseys for when you're playing somebody yeah, I'm sorry, besides yeah, I'm... the they played the lightning last yeah. night. Just save them for when you're playing somebody else. You throw those on, you just cannot lose. Can't do it. You can't. I mean, they went they lost in a shootout, so it is what it is, but it's been a tough season for the Stars, man. I really think they uh, they they gave it everything they had last year on that cup run, man. I mean, that was just such a great run for them. We were afraid that might happen. I was, yeah, I was. Uh, I didn't see them running it back at all this year. It was just they rode their luck a fair bit, and Kudob and stood on his head for a lot of games, and then. I'm looking now. Where are they at? Have they completely? F no, I mean they're still. They, it's it's all off base because they've missed so many games. Yeah. So I'm looking now. Chicago holding down the fourth spot in the Central with 33 points. 
but they've got 30 games played. Yeah. You look at Dallas, they've only played 25 games and they've got 25 points. So they're still within striking distance. If Chicago has cooled off a little bit, but they're still... But what are they going to do? They're just going to play all these games at the end, what everyone else has done? Yeah, but if uh, if you get hot then... <laughs> I mean, you're back then in the you game. Also, you also know exactly what you'll need at that point, too. Yeah, that might be that might be worse. You know, playing, holding the stick a little tight. You know, True. you need to win five True. straight to get in. And then if they bust those jerseys out again, you got to know. All right, boys, we're going to start strong, <laughs> but this time maybe we f- we finish the game. We don't let them back in. I got confused. I was thinking of uh, Anaheim, who did the same thing against Colorado, and then Colorado lit them up for six straight. But. Uh, all right, let's get out of here. We, we've gone gone a decent bit here today. This was a long one. Uh, appreciate you guys for rocking with us uh, and showing us some love, especially on YouTube. If you're listening to this on the podcast, please go check us out on YouTube. Uh, we don't have the URL we want yet. We're still, we still got a few more days to wait for until we get that. But uh, if you just go to YouTube.com and type in that's hockey talk you'll find us we obviously are going to tweet links out and we'll have swipe ups in our instagrams and all that as well uh and if you and if you're listening to the podcast and you enjoy it if you're watching on youtube and you enjoy it tell your friends we appreciate the love we as many subscribers as we can get love to have you on board love to hear from you guys too if you if there's something you want us to talk about you think we need to talk about we're not talking about enough we need to talk about more let us know we'll, we'll look at it we'll work it in like i said we didn't give the wild enough love i've been watching caprizov i don't know why it's just it's Minnesota. It was par for the course. We just push it down to the end of the pile. Sometimes we get to it. Sometimes we wouldn't. Now all eyes are far, firmly focused on Kaprizov. So uh, love you guys. Shout out AQ. Again, congrats on the new gig. Good to have you back. Uh, we're also looking to get some more guests on this show. We've got a couple that we've had in the past that we'll bring back now that we're doing just YouTube. And if you think uh, someone would be good on the show, tweet at them, tweet at us. Say, hey, because we've had success with that in the past. Say, uh, hey, we think they'd be a good person to talk to. That always works out, helps us out big time too. So appreciate all you guys do that for us. Uh, thank you. And uh, that's Hockey Talk.